Cows Torquay. The very names stir the hearts of powerboat racing men, and 1981 sees the Cows Torquay Cows offshore powerboat race come of age. 21 years ago, after competing in the famous Miami Nassau race, Sir Max Aitken determined that Britain too should have its own great race. That first event and its successors have developed into a truly great classic offshore race, the Cows Torquay Cows, which becomes the Toyota Grand Prix. In those 21 years, many changes have taken place. From the intrepid efforts of rich adventurers in their pleasure cruisers, men like the first winner Tommy Sopwith in 1961, to the highly developed, fully professional equipes of the racing thoroughbreds of today. Speeds have escalated as the years have passed. In 1961, regarded as one of the roughest races ever, Sopwith averaged 25 miles per hour. In 1980, American Bill Ellswick averaged a record 79.64 miles per hour to win in Paul Clauser's boat, Satisfaction. The atmosphere of a big sporting occasion is developing on race day when the competitors begin to come out of the sheltered marina. The patrol and rescue launches, observer boats and search and rescue aircraft are being positioned along the 245 mile route. At the pre-race briefing the day before, the weather forecast suggested calm seas and winds of less than 10 knots, with the worst possibility that of mist and fog. On the day, that forecast is well wide of the mark. No mist and a fresh southeasterly wind to give even the Solent waters a considerable chop. Dark rumours begin to come in to race control, suggesting that conditions on the long sea leg across Lime Bay are already deteriorating. Nothing, however, is daunting the crowd, which is beginning to gather on the full length of the esplanade at Cowes. Crowds are also waiting along the south coast of England. At Hurst Point, Christchurch Bay, Bournemouth, Poole, Anvil Point, Portland Bill and Berry Head in Torbay. Spectators are not confined to dry land. An armada of small ships gathers off Cows Harbour in preparation for the start of the Cows Torquay Cows. 
12 Class 1 and Class 2 boats are entered for the big race, whilst 43 Class 3 boats are entered for the round the island race. Some British hopes rest on the big cougar cat Tolman Group, which is already demonstrating here that conditions are not ideal for catamarans. The Scarab Monohull Satisfaction is the very boat which won here last year, but this year is driven by her owner Paul Clouser, who already has the classic American race, the Benihana Grand Prix, to his credit. The Don Shed designed Deep V Monohulls may well be best suited to today's conditions. This is Ego, driven by Needles Trophy winner Renato Della Valle. Number 85 is driven by former rally driver Alberto Smania. A very strong Italian contingent is completed by former European champion Guido Nicolai in Dry Martini. Desperately hoping for a change of fortune is Michael Doxford in Peter Stuyvesant. This monohull runs two big turbocharged Jaguar V12 engines. Already flying from the Royal Yacht Squadron flagstaff is a white and blue flag which indicates that the race will be run over the full 245 mile course, though there will be some competitors wishing that the foul weather course had been selected. At five minutes to go, a maroon was fired, bringing all the boats in behind the start boat. The red hydrofoil start boat accelerating to 30 knots with the Union Jack flying in the stiff breeze. When the national flag is lowered, the race is on and the large fleet of competitors is starting the 1981 Toyota Grand Prix, the 21st Cows Talkie Cows offshore powerboat race and the 14th Round the Island race. It's on! Immediately, Guido Nicolai in Dry Martini goes into the lead. Disputing it right behind him are his two fellow countrymen, Renato Della Valle and Alberto Smania. It's Smania in number 85 who goes up into second place. Three monohulls lead this race. Is it to be the story of the race? From our camera position mounted on the press boat, we can see the rough conditions even here at the start. 0-1 Tillman Group moves up to pass Gold Rush. Behind the three Italians, we have Roman Sabre being taken by Peter Stuyvesant for fourth place. Then in sixth place, it's Satisfaction with Paul Clouser. And then Gold Rush. Tillman Group seems to be having troubles even at this early stage of the race. Ian Rousel in Mirage 2 demonstrates the difficulties which the small Class 3 boats are going to have in the Round the Islands race. Deep Fresh leads in one of the cruiser classes. For the even smaller Class 3B boats, conditions are even more treacherous. Here, Bill Matcham's boat, Armacryl, practically disappears beneath the waters. Many of the Class 3 boats retired almost at the outset of the race, and one of them was Feanagen 3, driven by Russell Bamford and Graham Stewart. The early race leader is Guido Nicolai in Dry Martini. In second place, Renato Della Valle. And closing on Della Valle is Peter Stuyvesant. Alberto Smania had to adjust his course and is now back in fourth place. Here we see Peter Stuyvesant closing up on Della Valle. The two are side by side as they head down toward the East Leap marker. This is a European battle, Italy versus Great Britain. And yet, the Italian boat was designed by Englishman Don Shedd whilst Doxford's cigarette was designed by American Don Aronau. For Michael Doxford, the 1981 season is one of development. Having taken the brave decision to develop the big turbocharged Jaguar V12 engines, Doxford has suffered from very poor luck in competition. To crown it all, his big cougar cat Peter Stuyvesant too very nearly sank in the Needles Trophy race, though he would not have wished to run it in these conditions. The big Jaguar engines have enormous power potential and could eventually cause powerboat designers to go back to the drawing board to cope with the power output. That is yet to come. For Michael Doxford's first priority is to change his luck and overcome some of the minor problems which frustrate his victory efforts. The 21st Cows Torquay race threatens to vie with its most illustrious predecessors. Dry Martini still leads, but closing a little is the battle for second place between Della Valle and Doxford. In fourth place is Alberto Smania. His Don Shed designed monohull was built in the CUV yard in Italy and once raced under the famous Alitalia banner. The 1981 Toyota Grand Prix is still in the comparatively calm waters of the Solent, and yet all thoughts of a fast race have gone. More, it is a question of who will and how many can survive the full distance. In fifth place is last year's winning boat, Satisfaction. Perhaps Paul Clouser is biding his time. In an amazing sixth place overall at this point is Clark Group Racing. It is leading the Round the Island race. At the end of the Solent lap, it will take a different course to the Class 1 and Class 2 boats. 
here we see leading class two, Aquaglide. But Robert Cook is having to take a very gentle line past the East Leak marker to lead class two. Close behind and second in the class is Gold Rush. This is the second of the two boats which sport a wing. Surprisingly, down in ninth place overall is 021 Tolman Group. She appears to be in some form of difficulty, but with both engines still running, it's difficult to say at this stage what that problem may be. Tenth past the marker and second in class three is Popjoy Mint 2. This boat is driven by a seasoned competitor, Peter Bloomfield. In 11th place is Barry Drinkwater's Phantom, whilst in 12th place, a very spectacular Ian Burney approaches the marker. Ian Burney in the West Centre Hotel's Class 3D boat. As ever, he is attacking the heavy seas. In 13th place, Robert Blatchford in bootlegger. This small Class 3D boat is powered by a single 225 horsepower Mercury engine. In 14th place, Peter and Jan Armstrong in aphrodisiac. They turn very tight past the marker, just ahead of Tommaso de Simone in Pantera. This is a class two boat, which is just leading the 16th competitor to round East Leap, Feanagin. Crewed by Tolman twins, Gary and Michael, this is the phantom monohull they have elected to use in today's very difficult conditions. Their choice is certainly justified. They are lying seventh in the round the islands race, which is a 69 mile event, comprising one lap of the Solent and then one lap around the whole of the Isle of Wight. If these rough seas prevail in the Solent, what can the competitors expect when exposed to the full seas of the English Channel? Under these conditions, the little Class 3 open racing boats are perhaps less well equipped than the slower but partially enclosed cruiser class boats against which they are racing. Competitors must summon up all and more from their reserves of courage and stickability if they are to finish the race. Some will fall by the wayside, and even now the list of retirements is growing. Over 50 boats started the race. Far, far fewer will finish it. One of the more spectacular of the Class 3D boats is Ian Burney's Phantom West Centre Hotels. We asked Ian Burney, what's it like in these conditions, from the driver's point of view? It's very, very hard. You, you, for one thing, you can't see where you're going. Uh, there's so much water coming over the front in a following sea, going up to the start line. And when we turned the bottom mark to go back up the Solent, it was just so rough and our bow tank was broke, we couldn't put any water up the front and therefore we couldn't keep the boat in the water. It was really, really bad. Ian almost hits the now stationary Tillman group, evidence of the driver's difficulty to see ahead. Ted Tillman has lost his visor and the terrifying drama of what happened can only be told by the driver. Uh, I, was, I was jumping from 15 feet from one side to the other and no way could I see a damn thing. And the whole thing was just too dangerous. There was no way in this world that I could run through that water. We tried a few times and when I stood the boat up one end and the thing was looking at me vertical and I wasn't too sure that thing was coming over on my head or going out the other way, I decided that, that was enough. So it really is a stroke of very bad luck. Yeah, I've got two arms and two legs and, and boy, I wanted to keep them that way. As simple as that. One chap, I understand, broke his arm anyway, but I wanted to keep mine together. Strong words from Ted Tolman. Those action shots giving some indication of Tolman Group's difficulties were taken by an amateur cameraman. At this stage, Ted Tolman is still trying to solve his problem of visibility. Ian Burney is still demonstrating vividly the enormous problems that the Class 3D boats are having in these rough conditions. Gold Rush is still lying second in class two. As she alters course to avoid the red funnel line car ferry, we turn our attention back to Ted Tolman. With no visor and with goggles which refuse to stay in position at speed, with a catamaran which at times looked more like a rocket on a launch pad as the bow swept repeatedly through extreme angles, the Tolman group crew now face up to the inescapable fact that for them the race is over. Throttleman Smitty has crossed over to discuss the problems with Ted Tolman, but the decision remains the same. There will be no sweet taste of victory for Tolman in this cows talky cows, but he still has high stakes to play for this season, with two more races in America before the World Championships at Key West, Florida in November. 
Having qualified in Australia, he is assured of a place in the World Championships, but his current aspirations are to win in America against the toughest opposition and perhaps still to win the coveted Harmsworth Trophy. At the end of the Solent lap, Guido Nicolai and Dry Martini head towards Yarmouth and out into the open seas. With Paul Clauser in satisfaction in second place and number 85 Alberto Smania third, we are now about to witness the difficulties of the big boats in these very rough seas. In second place and making ground on Dry Martini is the American Scarab boat, Satisfaction. At this stage, our low-flying helicopter, which is practically sitting on the tail of Satisfaction, is hit by the wake from the power boat and very nearly brought down into the sea. We now turn our attention to the Round the Island race. The revelation of the 1981 British offshore season has in many ways been the performances of Clark Group Racing. This small, 25-foot, 4-inch Phantom has been raced in a truly cavalier fashion by its crew, John Clark and Len Ferguson. Their first ever race was in the prestigious London-Calais-London London race this year. Despite the physical punishment absorbed in that race, the Clark Group crew went on to win the Class 3 race in the Needles Trophy and are here in the Round the Island race with a massive overall lead. Fellow competitors would have words of caution for John Clark and Len Ferguson, but they seem to know only one way to race, flat out. Their technique and bravery is amazing in this race, and we can see the incredible attitudes of the little phantom whilst coping with the heavy seas. These are surely some of the most spectacular of powerboat racing scenes. Later in the race, as if the problems of the seas are not enough, the hydraulic steering breaks down halfway round the island and Len Ferguson spends upwards of 30 nautical miles sitting in the engine well steering the engines with his feet. After the race, John Clark summoned up the energy to talk to us whilst Len Ferguson was nursed back into the land of the living. John Clark, tell me the story of your race in the Round the Island race today. Very hard, very hard going today. Big seas, huge black holes. <laughs> Len and I thought, well, OK, we wanted the rough, and we had it. Uh, within 10 minutes, he had had his helmet ripped off, and there was no strap failure. It was just the force of water actually tore his helmet off. We turned about and picked up the helmet, and we headed for the fort. And I said to Len, well, OK, uh, who's running number two? And we looked about, and there was nothing, in fact, behind us at all. About halfway around the island, the hydraulic steering failed, and Len, in fact, got into the got into the engine well, and he sat there for the duration of the race. And we were actually on the plane, running on 10, 12-foot waves, with Len sitting in the engine well, operating the uh, steering uh, gear and the linkage with his feet. Unbelievable. He must either be mad or very, very brave. Well, he's a strong character. And he, uh, in fact, uh, towards the end of the race, he was almost giving up. But at the sight of cows, and I said, come on, let's make an effort, let's, let's go. I didn't actually physically say that, or literally say that. I gesticulated to him and he said, OK, let's go. And we found that at the end we had been disqualified. Uh, 
<laughs> and we came in second, a little behind Pop Choi Mint. If there were an award for courage at the end of this race, there is no doubting that Clark Group Racing would receive it. In the main race, the Toyota Grand Prix, the 21st Cows Talk E Cows, the leading competitor is passing Portland Bill, a familiar landmark. And in this picturesque setting, the crowds stare out to sea to follow the fortunes of the competitors. Alberto Smania in number 85 leads as he sets out to cross Lime Bay. His target is this boy. The lonely knell of the bell tells of the marker, the Skerries Bank boy, 113.3 nautical miles from the start at the Royal Yacht Squadron. Alberto Smania finds the boy in one and turns to head for Torquay, which in 1961 was the ultimate destination and the finishing line for Tommy Sopwith. In 1981, Torquay is a little over half distance, and so leader Alberto Smania and the other competitors have an enormously hard task to endure before crossing the finishing line. Dry Martini, after a splendid early lead, passes the Skerries in second place and has obviously had a dramatic Lime Bay crossing, as Mike Mantle, the navigator, now tells us. Well, we were about uh, 15 minutes out of uh, uh, into Lime Bay from Portland Bill, and things were going very well, we were very comfortable, and we suddenly ran into some overfalls or some bigger waves, and we put the boat right through the back of one, which flattened all the uh, windscreen and windshield off and almost took us out of the boat, uh, filled the cockpits up, and it, uh, Guido got the worst of it being in the middle, and uh, we had to stop and sort ourselves out for some minutes. Well, we, we, the, we were in a following sea and a uh, boat running fast. The danger always is that, the, that you don't quite reach the next wave while you're planing down or surfing down the wave you've just gone over. And that's what happened. We, was, we were planing down one wave and the boat wasn't enough distance for us to get up the next one. So we poked the bow straight into the next one, probably about two or three feet from the top, still doing about 65 miles an hour. And the effect is that the water rushes down the deck at about 65 miles an hour, probably weighing almost a quarter of a ton, and it just hits you. And uh, we have a very strong aluminium windshield on the boat, and uh, that was knocked about a foot out of square, right flat onto the deck, which obscured half the instruments as well. Um, and it did that before it hit Guido, but he was still pretty badly hit, so it was quite a, quite a bang. Did he lose consciousness? No, he didn't, no, but he's got filled up with water. Drama indeed for Dry Martini. If you can't afford a helicopter, try this for an aerial view of offshore racing. The hang glider has timed his effort to perfection as Alberto Smania passes underneath. The face of the race has changed, and here, satisfaction in third place, but outward bound, passes the leader on his homeward course. It is clear now that number 85 has weathered the ravages of the Lime Bay crossing best. The 39-year-old eligible Italian bachelor, Alberto Smania, leads the 21st Cows Talky Cows offshore powerboat race. Alberto has always been in love with the sea, as one would expect from an industrialist who comes from the beautiful island city of Venice with its ancient nautical traditions. After eight years of rallying for Fiat, Smania turned to powerboat racing in 1979. Immediately he was successful, winning the Italian and European Class II championships that year in La Smanietta. In 1980, he stepped up into the top Class 1 category and finished third in the European Championship, running his boat, La Smania. Now, he aspires to the World Championships. This 38-foot monohull was designed by Don Shedd and built in aluminium at the CUV yard at Via Reggio in Italy in 1978. It is powered by twin 600-horsepower Mercruiser engines. Alongside Alberto Smania is fellow countryman Alberto Diridoni. But once again, it is an Englishman, Robin Culpin, who is given the responsibility of navigation in his home waters. Robin has done his job well so far, and now the Italian is headed toward the Torquay mark. At this point, the competitors will turn into the very strong southeast winds for the second and probably even rougher crossing of Lime Bay. By his comparatively trouble-free crossing, Smania leads, but Dry Martini is battling on despite the intense battering she has suffered in Lime Bay. She turns through the Torquay mark, and we can see that despite everything, she is very much in touch with Alberto Smania. After three hours of racing, less than a minute separates the leading pair. 
In fact, Guido Nicolai is making a big effort to close the gap and navigator Mike Mantle takes a short cut between the rocks. Here, Paul Clauser and Satisfaction have already passed the scariest boy in third place. Paul has a considerable challenge on his hands today. He wants to take victory in the boat that won last year. He also wants the personal satisfaction of victory in this British classic event. In America, it appears, they do things differently, as Errol Lanier explains. Are you serious when you say that you, the race would not have been run in America, they'd have held it over for another no, day? No, the race would not have been run in America because the drivers have a lot to say about whether the race is run or not, not the officials. Because the people in America, they have, uh, you know, a boat worth $250,000. They don't want to go out there and tear it up. And that's exactly what you do in a race like this. Just being out there running 30 miles an hour is no test for nothing. What problems did you have? I had a fuel filter that had collapsed. So what I had to do, I had to, to stop the motor, take the filter out, and, and then, then reassemble it. And because the filter had plugged up completely, I didn't have any fuel pressure at all. So we, you know, without any fuel, it can't run. So I had to stop, and then we also had a uh, rope caught in the propeller. We must have hit one of the, the lobster traps or whatever that they have out there. So we had to stop and undo that too. Oh yes, we carried right on because they, after the filter was out, we had no problem. So we just kept on and, you know, we wanted to finish this race because, uh, I don't know, it was just a matter of, you know, we will do it. Even though we don't agree with it, we will do it. The Americans are great competitors, so if the race is on, rest assured, they will race to win. At this point, we rejoin some of the competitors in the Round the Island race, which in calm conditions can be completed in under one hour. 001 Flying Foxes is a Class 3 seaboat. She was one of the many retirements from the race. P-42 is pent-up fury, Michael Lloyd's Orlinsky Fairlane cruiser, which goes on to win its class and finish second overall. He is partnered by Chris Duffy. Number 25 is Property Growth Assurance, driven by Les Walling and Mike Jones. They finished third in the Round the Island race and were rewarded with the Class 3C victory. This now puts them in a strong position for the British National Class 3 Championship with two races remaining. P-52 is Video 1, a Shetland cruiser driven by David Baker. It is significant that the cruiser class boats have done so well in the extremely rough conditions. They are built for staying the race and surviving the conditions, which they have obviously done well. P-4 is David Graham Smith's cruiser class A, Aeon Splashdown a 23-foot boat built by Hunton Powerboats, which won its class in the London Calais London race. This powerboat also carries the latent power, and the big oil tanker makes light of conditions that have terrorized the tiny power craft. Winner of the 14th Round the Island race is number 31, Pobjoy Mint 2, designed and built by Ray Stapley. She was driven by the amazingly successful British driver, Peter Bloomfield. In his 14th season of powerboat racing, he captures that coveted Round the Island victory with co-driver Jim Baker. Following the Round the Island, the big crowd of spectators at Cowes were treated to a truly magnificent aeronautical display by the Red Arrows.
Back at Portland Bill, the main race is beginning to build up to its climax. Number 85, race leader Alberto Smania, is headed towards Anvil Point, Poole, Bournemouth and the protected waters of the Solent. But at this stage, there is still rough water to come. As we rejoin Dry Martini, we can see that the second placed boat is still having to battle through rough waters, and it is beginning to look as though Guido Nicolai is suffering from some ill effects of the battering. Guido Nicolai first won the Cows Talky Cows in 1979 in Dry Martini 2. He covered the distance at an average speed of nearly 64 miles per hour, but he will be hard pressed to produce those speeds today. Who can blame Dry Martini for opting for the survival course? Racing is about winning, and as the saying goes, to finish first, first you have to finish. At Hurst Point Castle, the race is nearly run. In the closing stages, the strong southeasterlies abate, and the seas die down as if to receive the smiling Italian, Alberto Smania. As he almost cruises up the Solent, he is confident of victory, confident of winning the 1981 Toyota Grand Prix. After over five hours of the most gruelling and punishing racing, a jubilant Smania has time to give a thumbs up to our cameraman. You can imagine the smiles of victory behind the helmet visor. Despite the differing attitudes to the race, the Cows Talky Cows has a history of providing a stern test. Whether it be a test of speed, of endurance or survival, it has over the years been a supreme examination of overall quality in powerboat racing. The 21st Cows Talky Cows has been no exception. And as they approach the Royal Yacht Squadron and the cannon salutes the winner, we also salute Alberto Smania, the Venetian winner. When number 85 crosses the line, she has been racing for 5 hours, 5 minutes and 14 seconds to average only 49 miles per hour. The slowest race since a decade ago when another Italian team of Ronnie Benelli and Commander Attilio Petroni raced to victory in Lady Nara. But the conditions were very bad. The pundits will now discuss how the coming of age race rates in severity against the very first, or perhaps that 1971 race. That today's race is compared with those of yesteryear is an indication of its quality and difficulty. Alberto Smania can now relax and enjoy the fruits of victory. For others, the race is still on and Dry Martini, after persevering through appalling dangers and difficulties, has won through. She approaches the finishing line to cross 26 minutes and 58 seconds after her fellow countrymen. The Royal Yacht Squadron Maroon is fired to signal the end to Nikolai's torture. Making her approaches to the end of the 250-mile race is satisfaction. 
with David Gilmour now driving to give some relief to Paul Clouser in this gruelling race. Paul and Errol Lanier seem to invite the cameraman to step aboard for the final mile, such is the closeness of the attendant helicopter as Satisfaction completes her second Cows Talkie Cows race in third place. The Toyota Grand Prix, the 21st Cows Talkie Cows International Offshore Powerboat Race, takes its place in the history books. It will record victory for number 85, Alberto Smania of Italy, at 48 miles per hour. It will not record that this was a great and gruelling race against high winds, tough, rough seas, in boats built for high speed, but forced, against the might of the elements, to fight to fight to survive and to fight to finish.